Sir Dagman. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm really excited to talk to you all today about my Source to Sea canoe trip. And my goal is to show you about an hour worth of photos and share some stories so that you'll all quit your jobs and you'll all start up in Montana this summer and canoe the river. And if that doesn't work, um, my, my next goal is for the next time you cross the Missouri River to see another side to it. So you can look down at that river and you can imagine what it looks like 1,500 miles upstream all the way to the most beautiful mountains in the world. And you can imagine what it looks like downstream all the way to the ocean. And you can imagine what it's like to live on that river and to use the river for recreation and to be really happy and really excited that this amazing resource flows through Kansas City. So to start, I want to introduce the name of my project, which is On the River. And we had three goals on our trip. And the first one was to have an adventure. Check. Um, we ended up canoeing about 3,400 miles. It took us about five and a half months. We started last July, and we finished up in December. Uh, the second component of our trip was to connect the river to education and to share the story of the river with students along the river. I grew up in Westwood here in Kansas, and I did not know a thing about the river, really. I, all I knew is that if you went close to it, you'd probably die. And so one of, my, one of my goals was to show students all along the river that not only do they live next to a really beautiful, awesome river, but that they're connected to the river, they're connected to the ocean, and they're connected to the mountains. The third part of our, or the third goal of our trip was to connect to a conservation project. A lot of us in the group were biologists, and we wanted to use our skills to help the scientific community collect data. And so we teamed up with an organization called Adventures and Scientists for Conservation, and we collected 36 water samples along the route to test for microplastics. And so I'm going to talk about all of these goals sort of intermixed as I kind of share the story of the river from source to sea. So the first part of an adventure is to get excited and spend a lot of time looking at maps. Okay? If you're an adventurer, you spend half your time adventuring and the other half of your time looking at maps. So let's look at a map. This is our source to sea route. And we didn't choose the ultimate source. So if you can imagine, the Missouri River has lots of tributaries. The longest tributary gets the name of the official source, which is Bower Springs. But we didn't start there. We actually started up in Glacier National Park. And we wanted to start in Glacier because I've spent quite a few summers in Glacier, hiking around, counting tadpoles, playing in the water. And I wanted to see where that water went. I wanted to connect that water to my home in Kansas City and all the way to the ocean. So there's a lot of awesome peaks in Glacier. If you haven't been, put on your list right now. Go to Glacier, it's beautiful. And one of the peaks that we started at, or the peak we started at, is called Triple Divide Peak. And we started here because, of, as the name hints, it has a few divides. It has three divides, I guess you could say. And those divides make it possible so that at the top of Triple Divide Peak, water can flow to three oceans. It can flow west to the Pacific Ocean. It can flow east to the Atlantic Ocean, thanks to the Continental Divide. And there's a Laurentian divide there also, and that means it can connect, uh, or flow, excuse me, to the Arctic Ocean via the Hudson Bay. So here we are on top of Triple Divide Peak. I'm the angry one at the bottom there. That's my angry, happy face. And we're happy for a few reasons, some of the obvious reasons. We made it to the start of our trip. And I'll talk about some reasons we, other reasons we're happy. But first, I want to introduce the team, because um, there were quite a few of us on this trip. And it was only made possible because we were a, a great team. So myself, I had the idea. I wanted to go on a trip. I had walked across the country, and I'd biked across the country. And I, I really wanted to see, see the country through the perspective of the river. And I wanted to go on an adventure where I didn't have to deal with cars. So the river was a great opportunity for me. Before this trip, I had you know, done the occasional two-mile canoe trip on a lake going something like a zigzag. And so I decided to do this trip, and I went to the Boundary Waters, where one of my friends was living. And she gave me a seven-day tutorial in the Boundary Waters. And so I was like, all right, 
canoeing. I can do it. Let's, let's go on a long trip. Um, but I knew I didn't want to go on the trip alone, so my friend Nia was the first to join me. She's in the middle there, and she's from Wales, and I knew we could get along because we'd done some bike touring together. I also knew that I can be difficult to get along with, and if she and I were in a canoe together for six months, one of us would end up swimming. <laughs> so I really wanted four people on this trip, and so I was happy when my friend Aaron, who is to the right of Nia, um, decided to join us. And it was extra exciting because he just finished his degree as getting his uh, 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 teaching degree. So he could really add a lot to the education component. And then my friend Matt, who's on the other side of Nia there, sh he joined up and that was really exciting because Matt knew how to canoe. He, <laughs> yeah, he'd, he'd actually, can he's canoed over a 30 foot waterfall. And the first thing I thought was, yes, there's no 30 foot waterfalls on this trip. But if he couldn't teach us to canoe, no one could. And he was really helpful in figuring out what gear we needed and, and all that kind of stuff. He actually also was the one that said, yeah, we can bring our bikes. So that sort of leads me to, a, oh, I guess I should point out the last two people. Tommy and Sarah were our, six, our fifth and sixth canoers. They were only there for the summer months, but it was awesome to have them for that, just that awesome energy and to make this team. And so to describe this team, there's one story that really sticks out in my mind, and it's before the trip starts. And we all met up in West Glacier, which if we had followed the river that flows through West Glacier, we would have hit the Pacific Ocean. So we, had, we needed a plan to get over the mountains to the right side of the Continental Divide. And day one, the plan was very obvious. It was, we'll find a friend, and they'll drive our stuff over the mountains. That makes sense. Well, because of the team, because of who we are, that plan slowly disintegrated. We were, we were here for a challenge. We were really excited to start this trip. And so the plan eventually became hook our canoes to our bicycles and bike over the mountains to the right side of the divide. And this was about a 4,000 foot climb. And we did it at one in the morning. We started at one in the morning for two reasons. One, it's a very popular road. It's very beautiful. It's called Going to the Sun Road. And so it's very narrow and there's lots of traffic. We wanted to avoid the traffic. And two, we were over the legal vehicle length. So we had two 18 and a half foot canoes plus our bicycles put us at 23 feet. And we were only supposed to be on the road at less than 21 feet. So anyway, so we made it to the, to the right side of the divide. And we left our canoes and our bicycles and we hiked to the top of Triple Divide Peak. And we were so happy to be there because we'd been lugging these canoes. We were, they were brand new and we'd already, you know, dinged them up. So we were really happy to be on that peak. And, and we had three options, like I said. The first option, this is looking down to the Pacific Ocean from Triple Divide Peak. Not going there this time. This time. We, uh, we turned north and we could go down the Arctic Ocean drainage or we could turn east and head down the Atlantic Creek drainage. And this is the drainage we chose, spoiler alert. So we started hiking down the, down the creek, and it was just small drops of water at this point, snow melt, nothing, nothing else. We couldn't, couldn't canoe on it. In fact, here is the, the source of the river that is aptly named uh, Atlantic Creek, and it flows downhill until it hits Cutbank Creek. And just take a moment to look at this picture and remember that this water is flowing through Kansas City right now. This water is part of the Missouri River. And when you, when you go over the Missouri River next time, just remember that, that the river is being made way up in these mountains, just as small little creeks. So from Atlantic Creek, we walked downhill. And eventually, we were able to put our canoes in the water in Cutbank Creek. And Cutbank Creek, you can see our canoes are in the water, but we're not in our canoes because there was just not quite enough water yet. And we had a lot of stuff, as you can see. We had a lot of stuff. And even though our boats were really, really great at staying high on the water, with our extra, our weight, our 300 pounds of people, 
we still sunk in just, just enough that we would have just been scraping the bottom the entire, entire time we were on Cut Bank Creek. So while we're learning how to canoe on a creek, I do this because I was like, ah, I don't know which way to go. We, we were learning how to canoe. We were dodging rocks. We, we were scraping up our canoes. And we were most of the time just walking our canoes down the river. And it, it was not easy. We did this for about three days. And our shins were beat up. We were tired of this. It was mentally really exhausting. But it led us to the Marias River. Oh, but first, lots of really beautiful swallows. Cutbank get, Creek gets its name from its nice high creeks, and there are lots and lots of swallows. Um, and then here's the Marias River. And the Marias River was really, really beautiful, and it had enough water. Yes. So we were on our way. And the Marias River took us to the Missouri River. You're on the, we're on the Missouri River, and the Missouri River at the confluence with the Marias is historically important because it was at the Marias River that Lewis and Clark got to this confluence, and they didn't know which one was the true tributary. They didn't know if, which one was the Missouri River. So Lewis and one of his teammates, they went up the Marias River, and then they actually went up Cutbank Creek until they hit disappointment. Camp Disappointment, which got its name because they're disappointed that one, it was not going to be a route over the, over the mountains, and two, it was not going to be a route that took them into Canada to gain more territory with the Louisiana Purchase. All right, but we didn't have to make that choice, which was great. We were going downhill. There are people that go upstream. We've met some of them. They're crazy. <laughs> um, but we were going downstream, so it was a pretty, it was a pretty obvious turn. If you are not good with directions, go on a canoe trip. Downstream, downstream. So luckily, right after we hit the Missouri River, we entered the White Cliffs. And this was a phenomenal stretch of river. If you only have 10 days to canoe on the river and you're looking for a great spot, this is in, in Montana. It's, it's breathtaking, and it's built for canoe travel. So along the route, there's campsites. It's designated Wild and Scenic River. Extraordinary. And you see all these cliffs. School wasn't in session. We had all the time in the world. We spent a lot of time exploring. Here's one of the views we got, walking out on these white cliffs, a balance beam. And this particular spot is called Hole in the Wall. Maybe you can guess why. So there's really, really magnificent scenery. And there was also a lot of great wildlife. So one of my favorite animals we saw in this stretch was the soft-shell turtle. This is a really small one. And they're great at camouflaging, so they'll be just below the water, and they'll use that really cute nose to, at like a snorkel, to breathe and stay camouflaged. Nia always bragged to the students that I found it, and I let her. It's like, yeah, yeah. Another animal, I'm sorry, whenever I have a captive audience, I have to show another animal we saw a lot of was snakes. We saw lots and lots of snakes up in Montana, and I study amphibians and reptiles. And so I always have to make a little plea anytime I have an audience about snakes. So this snake is a rattlesnake. They're venomous, but they don't use their venom to hunt humans. They use their venom to hunt rabbits and snakes. And I always explain it to children that imagine if you're all asleep in your room and I sneak in and I start poking with you a stick, poking you with a stick. What are you going to do? You're probably going to kick me, maybe karate chop me, maybe call 911. You're going to fight back. And so a snake that's biting is simply just scared for its life. So this snake didn't do anything. It just sat there in the, in the reeds, wasn't scared. We weren't scared. It was very beautiful. A scarier animal was this one. <laughs> this was an eastern screech owl. And we were camped on the side of the Missouri River. We just pulled off on the banks, but we had a little guidebook, and it told us that this was the home of an old homesteader by the name of Liver Eating Johnson. <laughs> he, according to legend, had eaten 19 livers of the men that had been trying to kill him. He killed them and ate their livers. So we're a little on edge. You don't know what could happen out there. There's lots of... Uh, conifers sort of uh, rustling in the wind. It's dark, and we hear this noise that's like, ah! <laughs> And so we do what anyone does when they're camped in Liver Eaton Johnson's backyard. We make the sound back, ah! And then we hear, 
And it was a screech owl that had just come down to investigate who was, who was in their territory. And he just stayed there and, and hung out. And at this point, we share this picture with, with students. And I just want you all to imagine we would break the kids up into four groups. We have the barred owl. And then we have the eastern screech owl. And then we have the great horned owl. Something like that. And then we have the barn owl. That's, I apologize. It's like, <laughs> and we do a little owl orchestra. And it's beautiful. I won't make you guys do it unless you want. Let's all just do one barn owl. He says, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? <laughs> yes. Fifth graders are better than that. <laughs> so that was a scary, a scary animal. But the scariest thing of all up in Missouri is running out of food. So if you've noticed that not one of these pictures has shown a supermarket or really a building at all, and that's because there weren't any. We went grocery shopping about three times in Montana, and we were there for six weeks. Uh, this food stop here is, we've got enough food for 10 days, which 10 days, six people, that's one person's food for 60 days. But really, it's one person's <laughs> food for 80 days, because we were eating a ton of food. And so we have our bikes on our canoes. We found a bridge, pulled our canoes over, hopped on our bikes, and rode five miles to town. We had no idea the next, the next stop was a 75-mile bike ride. So this one was easy. And just to sort of give you, excuse me, give you guys an idea of what we were eating, breakfast was mostly pancakes, oatmeal, bagels. Lunch was a tortilla with usually a boiled egg and some cheese and some vegetables, a pickle if you're really lucky. And dinner was when we broke out our stove. We had a Coleman stove and actually a little propane tank. And so we could cook. We had about 10 meals we rotated through. My favorite was one we didn't really discover until later in the year, and we called it Thanksgiving. And yeah, why only have Thanksgiving once a year? So that was one of our, my favorite meal rotations. Um, and here's what all of our food looks like, or all of our stuff in our boats. There are boats in this picture. And so we have all the heavy stuff on the bottom. And then we'd just put our bikes on the top and ro or tie it all in. And so during the day, we couldn't really access a lot of our stuff. But we really liked having bikes. It was, it was a, a great sense of freedom. We could get out and really explore and stretch our legs. So in this picture, Aaron and Nia are in the front of the boats, and we're having what we call a floating snack break. This is what I think is the best part of a trip. You float, and you eat, and you watch the scenery go by, and miles, you just check them off. It's great. And we were in our canoes pretty much all day, except for lunch we'd get out. But that means during our snack breaks, we would, we would just float when we could. And I say when we could, because right after the White Cliffs is when we hit the basically the damned Missouri. The damned Missouri. And I say that because there were six big reservoirs that we had to cross, about 800 miles in total of still water, no current at all. And the biggest obstacle was not really even that there wasn't current, but that when there was really bad wind, the wind would bring up big chop, and it would really make canoeing difficult. And our first, our first reservoir was called Fort Peck. And basically, every single person in Montana told us we were going to die on Fort Peck. <laughs> It's not a joke. And so we, we were like, yes, we're going to do this. We were so amped up. We had brought three extra days of food for, for just sitting on the shore, waiting for the winds to change. Uh, and it turns out we didn't need that. We had great luck on Fort Peck. It was fairly calm. And we actually had what's even better than calm, a tailwind. And so we got to sail. We perfected our sailing. Uh, all of us in the group, we say it's really good there wasn't a seventh reservoir because we were getting really comfortable. 
and big chop with wind. And, and so it was good that it ended when it did. On the reservoirs, besides being completely isolated, really, it was really remote, really wild. There was a lot of great wildlife. So lots and lots of wildlife used the Missouri River as a corridor, especially migrating wildlife to get to the Gulf for the winter. We saw thousands and thousands of pelicans. Nia would wave to each and every one, see you when we get there, because the pelicans were faster than us. They weren't the only things that were faster than us. The butterflies were faster than us. Yeah. Um, so the monarch butterflies migrate to central Mexico, and a lot of them are on the Missouri River corridor. And up in North Dakota, we were seeing a lot, and taking lots of pictures, and really quickly we stopped seeing them, and it was because they passed us. <laughs> but that's okay, because yeah, we're only going to do this once. I guess they are too. But. So we are on the, on the river. We finally get to the last dam the last spillway. We portage with our bicycles. Almost every portage took two trips because we had a lot of stuff. We did, not, we did not go light. And here's the last spillway. We're really excited for two reasons. One, there is current all the way to the ocean. And two, there is water being released from the dams. So that's even extra current. So overnight, we doubled our speed and the river changed dramatically. So the Army Corps made the, the reservoirs, and they made them for a few reasons. One was flood control, and one was also just to hold water so that they could keep the lower Missouri navigable. And on the lower Missouri, they channelized the river, so they basically built walls to keep all that water that would normally just kind of spread out, be fairly shallow, lots of sandbars. They brought it all together, released the water, and that way it was navigable. And it was actually pretty great for us because it just kept us moving, it kept us faster, and it started to look a lot more like it does around Kansas City. And we got really lucky. You can see there's the start to fall colors. We got really lucky with the fall colors. It basically, the, the trees were changing in North Dakota. I was kind of worried. I was like, oh, yellow, North Dakota, we are very far from the ocean. But we kind of just stayed with those fall colors. And in fact, by the time we hit Mississippi, the leaves were turning green again. So I feel pretty lucky about that. Besides the channelization, besides the nice, well, there were trees again, we also started seeing a lot more human activity. We saw lots and lots of bridges. And every bridge is exciting. It's such an awesome perspective. You know, you go over bridges all the time. Really fun to go under a bridge and wave and get the trucks to honk. It's a good day. And another thing we saw that was less exciting, we started to see a lot more trash. Can you spot the frog in this picture? It's on the log. So this is an eddy. The whole river did not look like this all the time, but in the eddies, the trash kind of swirls around and kind of gets trapped there. And we did start to see a lot more trash. And I think this is a good moment to kind of talk about the, the research we were doing or the data we were collecting. Every 150 miles, we collected a one liter sample of water and we sent that sample to a lab, and they sifted through the samples to count how much plastic was in the water. So they were looking for microplastic. Plastic never breaks down. It just gets beat up. It get, breaks down to smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, but never disappears completely. And so this, this plastic is in our water. And it's one thing it's bad to just be drinking plastic, but it's also bad because that plastic absorbs pollution. It acts like a sponge. And so you're kind of drinking really toxic plastic. And that plastic bioaccumulates. So you can imagine uh, one fish eats 10 pieces of plastic over its life. Well, if a predatory fish eats that, eats that first fish, it's all of a sudden got 10 pieces. And if it eats 10 fish a, a week or a day, it's going to have 100 pieces before we know it. And then if I eat that fish, I get all that plastic. So it builds in, in the food chain. And, and this is certainly a problem. Now, because the Missouri River has got a lot of sediment, it's taken a while to get those samples counted. But we do have the results from the first seven. Oops, there, there's Matt collecting a sample. Here's, here's some of the results. So they're actually testing the water all over the world. They started in the oceans. This is Adventures in Scientists for Conservation. And they're moving to fresh water. And each dot represents a sample. And the bigger the dot, the more plastic was in the water. 
And our first seven samples all were taken in Montana where we had to bike 75 miles to get to a town. So you would expect the water to be fairly clean. Only one sample did not have plastic in it. And that's in just the first seven up in Montana. So I'm really excited to see the results. Okay, now that I've kicked you guys all, I'm gonna show you a nice pretty picture of a frog because frogs are great. And frogs are also bioindicators. So a frog is really sensitive to pollution. If there's pollution, they're gonna be the first to disappear. The most, they're gonna be affected first. And we were still seeing frogs. So the microplastic problem, it's not gloom and doom. There are solutions. It's not too late. In fact, there's a lot of great people in all, all up and down the river, but especially in, in Missouri that are helping with river cleanups. Just getting that trash out is gonna make a huge difference. And, and actually Congress just passed a bill to get microplastics out of cosmetics by 2017. So we're, we are making steps. Um, and it's really important because we drink this water. So since I kind of just like brought down the mood with a with, uh, plastic trash talk, I'm gonna bring it back up with the cutest animal we saw on the trip. It's the cutest and you all are going to have an uncontrollable urge to say, oh, and that's okay, okay? So, are you ready? Cutest animal of the trip. We saw a lot of these on the Missouri River. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> This is a, a Woodhouse's toad. It makes an amazing sound. I'm going to do it because you guys are so forgiving. It goes, Wah! <laughs> First time I heard it, I thought I was going to have to go save a bunch of babies. <laughs> um, but this frog, it's got a lot of attitude, and they're all over the Missouri River, especially up north. And they use the, the eddies and the little pools to lay their, lay their eggs. Okay, getting off track with the frogs. So I'm going to bring it back. Remember, we're in, we're in the channelized lower Missouri. We've passed Sioux City, and then we passed Omaha. And finally, we make it to Kansas City during the playoffs. Go Royals. <laughs> Thank you. And so this is where the Missouri River curves and starts heading east to St. Louis. We actually took a right and we went up the, the car there. And my dad, thank you dad, we did a bunch of scouting, or he did a bunch of scouting along the levees and found a spot we could pull out. And he hauled our stuff and I didn't tell my friends, so they hauled the canoes up the hills to Westwood and we had our longest break in Kansas City we visited four schools, and we gave our boats a UV treatment, cleaned our gear, had a day where we didn't do much, which was fun, and, and, and just enjoyed Kansas City. And then it was, it was on to St. Louis, the, the last stretch of the Missouri River. Um, another thing we had to do, do a lot of in Kansas City, I know it's so tough, was hang out with all the river angels. So a river angel is someone that helps a paddler, there's quite a few of them here today, and so thank you again. And they might help with a place to stay, with a meal, with some intel on the river, with a beer, everything that you could possibly want, they, they are gonna help you, help you get. And some of them, they don't even know the river angels, they just see you and they invite you to their, to their space or they invite you to their boat or their hunting camp. And others are more um, established, there's a Facebook page where you can meet a lot of them and talk to them and arrange, arrange to meet, meet with them. And one of the most famous is Joe Wilson. <laughs> Joe's here tonight. He drove out from Je Jeff City. And Joe has a, a spot with a great little, little beach. And he greeted us with flags. And he greeted us with not one but two bonfires. And we had a, a lot of great, we had a couple great evenings of storytelling by the fire, some music. And he also greeted us with a city council member. And that city council member let us come to the city council meeting. And after the declaration for the Royals win, we um, gave a little presentation about 
how important access to the river is and how important bringing communities that live on the river is getting them to come to the river and be part of, be part of this great resource. So we really had a lot of fun with, with uh, Joe. You can see the capital in the background there. It was a really awesome camp spot. It was exactly what I, what I was picturing, the fire and, and the traffic. Very iconic. So besides awesome river angels, Missouri also had a lot of really awesome scenery. This is, I think, right after the I-70 bridge, or right before it. And there's just incredible cliffs, really, really beautiful scenery. Another trip, if you have a week, is to canoe from Kansas City to St. Louis. And there's a lot of towns along the way, so you don't have to bike 75 miles to get groceries. You can just walk a quarter mile to get a beer. And uh, what else do you need? <laughs> so like I was saying with the River Angels, we wanted to say thanks in our own way. And there were so many River Angels in Kansas City, we spent a lot of our evenings painting watercolor postcards, which is how we said thanks. We'd send them a postcard that we painted with river water and paint. And this, this cliff inspired me a lot, and all, all of the scenery in Missouri really inspired me. So here's my version of the, uh, the cliffs. A little different, but... So we sent, we sent thank you postcards, and we really didn't want to leave the Missouri River. We really enjoyed, we enjoyed it. We knew it. We knew how it worked. There was only about a barge a day. And so we were a little hesitant to get on the Missouri, but... The river took us there, so we made it to St. Louis, and it was really exciting to canoe right by the arch. And right here is the port of St. Louis. We'd heard a lot of scary things about the port and all the barges. And if you can imagine, the, the port is basically a parking lot. And so barges are parking, they're going to the shore, they're not just doing the, the straight down the river. But it was surprisingly easy. Uh, we, we knew what we were doing to some extent. We knew we weren't going to cross in front of them. And we also had a radio, a marine radio, that we could, that we could talk to them on. We didn't talk for a long time because we were kind of nervous, so we just listened to them say things like, we got some kayakers, and I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and, and so uh, sometimes they'd be like a little nervous. I think they might be crossing, you know. And so finally one day I was like, I'm going to do it. And I just get down the radio, and I'm like, we're the canoers and we're going to stay on the red buoy line. And, what, they have a radio? <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> so then sometimes they'd start warning each other. They got radios, careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> but, so the barges actually weren't a big deal. Here's two barges. They're passing each other. One's going upstream, one's going down. The Missouri River was so wide that for the most part, the barges could have all the river they wanted. We didn't really need that much. And because the water was low, there are channel markers, there's buoys that indicate where the deepest part of the river is, and so they'll stay in there. So we'd stay in there when there weren't any barges because we wanted the fastest current. We're smart and lazy. And uh, when we'd see a barge coming, we'd just get out of the channel. There's also, if you notice, there's a couple kayakers in this picture. And we saw them in Kansas, or excuse me, in St. Louis. They were canoeing down the Mississippi River. Quite a few more paddlers do source to sea on the Mississippi, and we leapfrogged with them. I can't tell you how many times we were like, we're never going to see them again. We're never going to see them. I'm sure that's what they were saying. We finished on the same day in the Gulf. <laughs> For the record, we finished one hour earlier. <laughs> so besides the river being wide enough that the barges were not really an issue, the, the wide river allowed for plenty of beautiful sunsets and sunrises and just really beautiful scenery. I was really surprised at how beautiful the Mississippi and the Missouri was and how remote and wild they felt. We would go three or four days without even seeing a bridge. So we had to start buying a little bit more food again. So I said, if you notice, I said sunrise and sunset. If you know me at all, a sunrise and Sarah do not go together. But we were starting to get to, well, it was becoming winter. It was, I think, it, I think we hit the Mississippi in early November. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Anyway, the sun was, there was a lot less sun. And so we really had to take advantage of the light we had, which meant waking up 
and paddling from sunrise to sunset, which was great for, for awesome photos. Um, it was also awesome because along the way we were meeting with schools, we were organizing, we were calling teachers, we were making really bad videos, and we were painting postcards. We were just doing a lot of admin stuff. And up in Montana when we were paddling till 9 p.m., then we had to cook dinner and then we had to do all that stuff. So I really enjoyed this section because we were off the water by 4.30 and we were having campfires on beaches. I, I guess first I'll talk about, well, let me talk, show you the campfire. On the campfire on beaches and relaxing for three or four hours every night. And, and it, was, it was really fun. I skipped this slide here. This is one of the beaches we camped at. So when I say we're camping on the, on the river, that basically means we pull over to the side of the river and we camp. And sometimes that is a really beautiful spot. A lot of times the Missouri River was, a, was very muddy and steep, so that meant wading through quite a bit of mud. And we don't, when our canoes are full of weight, we don't drag them on the shore. We unload them. We bring everything up high enough that the river's not going to wash them away. Then we take the canoes out. We carry them even higher, flip them over, and tie them off. So that no matter what wind, a, a, the river rising, we're going to have those canoes in the morning. And we heard plenty of stories of people losing their canoes, waking up and being like, someone stole my canoe. And I really didn't want to have that morning. I'm not a morning person. That would have really hurt. So we made it extra sure to always tie up our canoes, keep everything high enough. The internet is also great. You can look at gauges and get an idea of what the river's doing and know if it's going up or down. So... This is a camp spot on the Mississippi. The Mississippi had a lot more sandbars, and camping was just perfect. Perfect. We could just pull off, and then there was driftwood everywhere for those fires. The fires were also great because about, I'm going to say, South Dakota, we bought a Dutch oven because we were like, we're already carrying 800 pounds. What's another 30? And so I'll admit I was, I was anti-Dutch oven for a while, but now I'm pro Dutch oven. Because with all these fires, all this time, we were cooking extravagant meals. This is our Thanksgiving meal. That is a pumpkin pie, and it actually was good. We had to cook two in one night. So we had lots of, lots of time. We ate way too many brownies on the stretch. Biscuits, pumpkin pie, pecan pie. And, and really just uh, had, fun, had fun being outside camping. We also had to up the ante on what we were cooking because about this time, we ran into our, our biggest logistical hurdle of the trip, and that was that Aaron had to leave to go back to work. And kind of all adventures that go on, you just, you just plan as you go. You can't make plans because they're always going to fall through. So you just know that you'll figure something out. We'll wing it. That's kind of my, my motto. And so the day Aaron left, we kind of looked at each other and were like, what are we going to do? <laughs> We need another paddler. And luckily, we met a guy, and he'd let us stay at his cabin, and he came along. So <laughs> so Pat, Pat was our first, our first guest, we called, paddling guest. And he was a def criminal defense lawyer, which was great for stories. And he... he canoed with us for about three days, and then his lawyer friend Brian joined us, <laughs> and Brian was training for Ninja Warrior, so it was awesome to have him along, and he paddled with us for about three days, and then my, my friend that I'd worked with, Maya, she came, and I took this picture of her, of her so that she could show her, her mom the barges, and I was like, don't worry, I'll crop out the sock. She was like, no. The sock really tells more about the trip than the barges. <laughs> so we were spending a lot of time in these boats. We were making them our own. We had pea buckets. I can talk about that later if you'd like. So we were really literally living in these canoes. And uh, when my socks get wet, you just you dry them. So after Maya was, this is not a joke, so we've had two, pre two lawyers, a teacher, and then we had our preacher come along. <laughs> And, and Park was a, a paddler. He's planning on paddling the Mississippi this summer. So he knew how to canoe, and he knew all the great camp spots. 
and it was a lot of fun to, to have a, a local kind of show us, show us the way. And then after park, we had our friend Maya join us. It was Matt's friend Maya, and she was awesome for two reasons. One, she was staying for two weeks, so we could finally just canoe and not arrange logistics. And second, Maya said out loud what I'm pretty sure all the guests were probably thinking, which was, you guys are disgusting. <laughs> and my favorite you guys are disgusting moment was when she called me out for drinking the, uh, the melted ice cream we'd had the night before. <laughs> I was like, you want some? And she's like, you guys are disgusting. I was like, but there's brownie chunks at the bottom. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of reasons to canoe, and a lot of them for scenery, yada, yada, meeting great people, but eating melted ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> so Maya helped us get all the way to the ocean, sort of crooked picture, but... The day we made it to the Gulf of Mexico, it was a horrible headwind. We, it took everything we had to get where, where we got. And we were, we were probably going about a, a mile an hour because the wind was so bad. And so when we saw a horizon without land, we were all like, yeah, that'll be good. That's good. That's good enough. So <laughs> we, we pulled over to the last bit of land we could see, and we did our dance. And we swam in the water. That was knee deep and kind of gross, but that's all right. And so we made it to the ocean. And, and for me, what's the most exciting about this moment is, is not that we made it to the ocean, but that this is a screenshot from a video that we did on making it to the ocean. And at this point, I don't even know, but quite a few students, at least, at least 15 schools, are following us on our trip. And they're at that ocean with us celebrating. And, and at this moment where we're showing them, look, we did it, we're telling them, look, you guys can do it too. You don't have to have a normal job. You can go do what you, what you want. You can do something that's scary. You can do something you don't think is possible. But look, you can do it. And, and so I want to talk a little bit more about the education component because I think that really was probably the, the heart of our trip was connecting to, to students. So like I said, there were three components to our education element, and that was first, classroom presentations. And our classroom presentations were about an hour, and we showed slides. We had kids sing like frogs. I didn't make you guys do that. And then to sort of uh, get, them, get them moving, we had them try out our gear. So they laid down on our camp, camp pads. They tried paddling. These are kindergartners, it's so adorable. And we also had them see how many students they could get in their tent. Our record was 15 kindergartners. And it's best if you say, get out of the tent one at a time. And we didn't do that the first time. We learned a lot as we went. The, another component was having them sign our canoes. This is the, the very, very beginning. We said, if you want, you don't have to, but if you want, you guys can make a pledge to the river. And instead of sending trash and chemicals down the river, you can send your name. And you can help the river, and you can connect your, your school, your name, all the way to the ocean. So we had about 1,000 kids sign our canoes. And then the part of the, the education element that was the most exciting for me and I think really very impactful was our river field trips. So we had about half of our schools met us at the river. And we showed them our gear, we showed them a little bit about what we do on the river. And then we would go on a exploratory walk where we'd make observations. And no matter where we were, whether it was a, a parking lot or a really scenic forest, kids can find awesome things. They're, they're great at finding detail, they're awesome scientists, and it was fun to sort of help train their eye and get them excited about the river, connect them to the river. So here's some seventh graders up in Iowa. You can barely see, but he's holding a little horsehair worm, which is a tiny worm. He found it in a mud puddle, and it looks like pasta. They did not believe that it was pasta. And they found it on their own, and they were so, so excited to find this, so excited to be scientists. Here's two girls up in North Dakota 
or excuse me, South Dakota. They're right next to the river. They're studying that mullein, that plant. They're making observations connecting to the river. And because I love snakes, I was super excited when we found this, this bull snake. It's a really gentle snake. It was a, a young, young one as well. And it was so gracious to let about 60 kin or fifth graders hold it. <laughs> I felt a little bad, but it was a good sport. And so these kids now have a relationship with the river. They've been there, and not only do they have a relationship, not only have they visited with the plants and animals, but they also, a lot of the times, help pick up, pick up trash. Kids love picking up trash. <laughs> it's great. One, I, had, I had one student, the teacher was like, ah, when he comes out of, the, of a little ravine with some trash in one hand and this really gross coyote skull in the other, and he is so happy to have found both, and the teacher's just like, <laughs> but that's what kids need to be doing, that's what they're going to remember, that's how they're going to learn and be connected to the river that flows through their, through, through their town. So after the field trip, a lot of times the kids would either get to see us leave or come to the river, and there's some kids in St. Louis waving us off, and really, this is the moment where they realize, they're canoeing down, the, down this river? It takes, it, it takes seeing it to believe it, I think. And, and these kids are waving us on, and they are part of the trip at this point. They're cheering us on. They want to know what happens. They want to learn about the river so that they can continue to follow us. And they followed us on, online, and also they would send us letters. This is my favorite drawing. I love this drawing. This is, from, this is from a student in Columbia, and we've got some other really awesome art. These are from some students up in, in uh, Pierce, South Dakota, and I was like, where have I seen Aaron that excited? And here it is. Look at that resemblance. <laughs> so this is a picture of a river angel named Peg up in North Dakota, and she's got ice cream for us, which is one of the reasons Aaron is super excited. The second is because she had a, a little or a campground with this perfectly perfect little cabin with a dock right there, so we didn't have to unload our boats. And it was it was perfect. It was great. And Aaron is really happy. <laughs> Excuse me. So I want to end this presentation kind of the same way I end it with with students, and that is with a question: Why would we do this? Why would you want to do this? And I think the best time to ask why is when it's really terribly miserable. And this is a picture where Nia and I look happy, but this is her 27th birthday, and it had been raining all day, not just rain, but like sideways, horrible rain. It was on a, res a reservoir, so we were going two miles an hour against the wind with chop, and every time the canoe comes down, water comes up, and it's pretty demoralizing, and every bend looks the same, and you're like, okay, I got, this is what I'm doing for the next 150 miles. And it can, be, it can be pretty demoralizing. And it was Nia's birthday, but one of the reasons we do this is because at this moment on the trip, we could not give up. There was, if we gave up, we would just starve to death on the side of the road. We had to keep going. And we found this little shelter, and we basically unpacked everything and built windscreens and set up our stuff, and we're drying our stuff. And Aaron snuck out. He kept saying he had to make a phone call, which is hilarious because Aaron doesn't use his phone, and it was raining, to make Nia a carrot cake in the Dutch oven. <laughs> and the reason I do this is because these moments are really special, and they're the moments that you don't forget. And they're the moments that challenge you and give you the sense that you can, if you can do this, you can, you can deal with the next bad weather. You can deal with the next obstacle that's thrown in your way. And it, it's just been such an awesome experience to see new places, to experience the river. And I know that no matter what adventure I go on, there will always be opportunities for horrible days that you'll learn from, that you'll remember because you survived them. There'll always be amazing people to meet. There'll always be funny experiences and interesting animals. No matter what you do, you can't go on an adventure and these things not happen to you. So it's actually, in a way, sort of easy. You just have to go and do it. So my next adventure is going to be a bicycle tour to follow the monarch butterflies. And you can learn about this adventure and all my past adventures 
at beyondabook.org. I'm trying to, to continue to link adventure to schools. And with that, I want to thank you.